Okay. We're back. I'd, I'd rather know the truth. And the things that uh, bother me right now are the, um, the lies and the, by the, you know, for so many years, Christians have prided themselves on, you know, well, at least they've got the Bible and they know what it's talking about. And when I pointed out a few simple discrepancies, uh, I was railroaded out of town. And I just, and I guess it's not really just about the Bible or Christianity or anything. I'm, I'm kind of looking at all of humanity in this way, of why in every group they do the same thing. And of course the Christians are not any different than any other group in terms of the behavior and, and who they, um, <clears throat> who each group serves, which the individual may be able to serve the Lord with, with great effort. And, and, and you got to be willing to be open to the mystery. It seems I run into so many people that have just shut off or look for someone who has the answer to the mystery because they can't come up with it. So they're endlessly following people that they think have some special touch from God. This one, this one knows. Does God have a message for me? Hey, touched one, does God have a message for me? What is, does God know I exist? Does he know my pain? Does he know my struggle? Does God realize how I've been treated unfairly? How uh, my life is is basically that of an uh, of a of a victim who has received no justice? Does God realize that I feel like God has abandoned me a long time ago? if I ever knew him. Please, Holy One, you must have a message for me. I'm in desperate need. I think I'll die today of sorrow and, no, and nothing else, just sorrow and nothing else. And I'm, that's, you know, look at that as like a little bit of a poem that sort of sums up the human condition that they're looking for a sign they're looking for anything to be able to point to something that shows after all God really loves them they're not abandoned all the horrors that they've seen will be wiped away, washed away. There will be no more horrors. I have a message to you right from the Lord. Your name is such and such. You've been through this trial and that trial. You have loved ones hurt. Something about a river. And the Lord wants you to know that you have not been forsaken. We can go right down the list with any kind of incident. And the person will say, that's me you are referring to. That's me. That's me. God's talking to me. And hence... You know, uh, it, it, we can we can draw also the 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 fact that people look to UFOs for the same thing. They they look to those as potential saviors, um, gods, if you will, who will you know rescue them from their miserable existence. And then we look to the the rapture concept, and they're waiting. God is. He wouldn't let me go through those horrible things. So they predict such horrible, horrible things in their 
prophecies, and quote, quote, quote. And the, 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 anything that they can think of that's terrible, and, and, and Jesus showed me this. And then all the children were suffering and dying of plague, but these crazy people came and ate them all, eating them alive, dining on their flesh while they writhe in the streets while they're still alive. A vision of true horror beyond any kind of apocalypse movie. Um, and, and animals ripping the flesh of humans and everything jumping on the humans. But, you know, thank God that the Lord came to rescue us because he cares about us. He, he hasn't gone away. He's not distant. He's, he's right there. He's, he's showing me horrible things that are going to happen to the world. And then he shows me being with him. And I'm not sure where we are exactly, but we escape this terrible scourge that's about to happen any time now. And we uh, are gone and they wonder where we went. And Jesus came for his bride, for his church. He wouldn't just abandon her. So you can have great faith that he's coming for you. He's prepared a place for you and he's taken you home. The horror is about to end. Just a little while longer. Just a little while longer and you will be enveloped in the light of Jesus Christ and ascend. You did your best to warn them and they used their free will in a way that you didn't want them to, but you did your best. Well done, good and faithful servant the Lord Jesus tells you as he gathers you up into the air. Well done, good and faithful servant. By all measure you have succeeded. Here is your crown, and here is your throne besides mine. Or rather, beside mine, to, be, to try to remain civilized here. You, above all, God knows you're suffering, <clears throat> and I'm offering you a special medal above and beyond the crown that shows that you've done exemplary work. Your works have judged much better than the rest. Hence you, saint, you go to the head of the line. You are at the head of this group over here, and many, many things await you, many responsibilities. You over there, you've also distinguished yourself in battle. Come forward and you will have this medal that shows you have a certain status as well. Above and beyond, of course, the, the, the multitudes there, the group that is, that is sitting there. You and people like you have responsibility to lead the others. And because of your exemplary works upon the earth, you have been selected to lead them, and lead them you will. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. And then they accept their crowns, and they accept their special medals, and they expect their leadership positions. They always knew it would be similar to the, the kind of structure they had at home in their church leadership, that their good works would be weighed and judged, as Jesus said, and would move them to the head of the line so that by the time the new Jerusalem occurs, they're not just going to be a toilet attendant. Oh, no, 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 no. They'll be at the very head of the line. And John MacArthur, he said it first. He says, I don't just want to be a sweeping dust. I, I want to do everything I can here on earth so that I'm assured a good position in the new Jerusalem. So that came from a top elder in the evangelical, uh, whatever. Are we being quite clear and precise? I'm not being, I, I, I suppose I'm being a bit facetious and a bit sarcastic, but I'm, I'm deadly serious. You yourselves are now filled with doubt about what you believe 
and what you don't believe. And that means you're about to use something that you've been told by cult leaders, government leaders, church leaders, and all in your community and your teachers, your coaches, your significant others and your leaders in your life. You're about to use something you are, have been forbidden to use all your life. It's called your brain. Yes. And now that you have doubt about the structure of things, please use your brain to discern the proper questions you need to ask. And by all means, do pull apart your concept of reality bit by bit, replacing it with something solid that cannot be shaken. In Jesus' name, amen. Why would God create man knowing what he would choose and knowing the outcome? Because if he didn't know the outcome, this is the opposite of what they teach in the churches. So listen up, please. If you want to hear the truth, listen up. I'll tell you right now. I'm going to tell you something that, that I've been, I can only go bit by bit, you know. I mean, you know, the, and this is the thing that I've been on. I've been in Genesis Ever since yesterday, I've been back in Genesis 6. And I'm, you know, I mean, what really disturbed me, the greatest horror movie I have ever seen, is Genesis 3, when God was looking for Adam, and Adam hid himself. And I believe that's the most horrific scene in the Bible, even more so than... 150,000 being killed. More so than millions and billions dying in the flood. Worse too than the swallowing up of the Egyptians, who I also care about, uh, by the, uh, the sea. So if you want, we may turn, and I'm, I know that this is the kind of thing that gets you burned at the stake, and I'm, I'm very aware of the risk of, you know, this is, we're now into the realm of the forbidden. They don't care. It doesn't matter whether when you talk about wickedness, what the meaning of the worker of iniquity means. That's an Old Testament term that Jesus would bring back. Um, what the second death is, what is blasphemy in the Holy Spirit, um, what is apostasy what is satanism which is you know the, the 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 thing about the bible and the church it deals directly with that we are plagued by demons on this planet who are running around amok and the only remedy of is of course the lord jesus christ and 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 they know that the demons know that so the satan knows that the satanists know that and so there's this emphasis on making it a very taboo which is not our intention and what what rather my pursuit is to um, this in the fifth verse of the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis and still if I had to have one book of course I would have the Bible I'm not sure whether I would want the Geneva or the King James, but maybe I'd like both. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord then said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing in the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. It seems I can't move on until we grapple with this. Do you see how disturbing it is that the Lord would know, um, would say, well, I'm going to destroy the creeping things in the fowls of the air, for it repents me that I made them.
In other words, innocent creatures too. I will destroy man because he's just wicked. I mean, all of them. When the Lord looks down, and then of course you have to tie in with the psalm, and I forget the the number of the psalm, and the Lord looks and he sees the hearts of many, he sees there's not, not one righteous, no, not one. So, I'm still here because the Lord has shown me that, of course, he knows the outcome of his creation of man. He knows whether it would repenteth him or not in, before the act of creation ever takes place. He knows the outcome of all things. He's also beyond all time and beyond all space. And he knows everything that will occur within space and time because if you're standing in eternity, time and space are behind you. So that if you were going to create, he would know, as he says, he knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. So he would know Genesis to Revelation before it ever got put into motion or created or written down. He would know that he would create the flood before he ever created the first tree or the first amoeba. He would know that he would um, that he would threaten man with uncreation should man continue in his wicked ways, which he knew that man would continue in his wicked ways. He understood the fall in the garden and the barring of the tree of life DNA from man. Because if man had eternality, he would be as a god. And that would not be allowed to happen. He'd be like us, says the Elohim. He would be a potentiated son or daughter of the Most High God. So obviously for that little slip up, there's going to be this thousands of years of pain and even that won't pay for it. Now, the Satanist will look at this passage and it will justify his position or the Luciferian, I should say. It will justify his position in Luciferianism and and worship of the god Lucifer I say the God little G, but the God Lucifer, to bring reason, light, civilization, learning. They were looked at in that way. And compassion that instead of being punished for, you know, what's one's makeup, it would rather be potentiated in Lucifer. and, And instead of shame and guilt, propelling the world. It would be um, reason and love, quote unquote. And so it's much more appealing, you see. Because Lucifer and his angels understand and want to help man, where Yahweh just seems to want to punish man. So that is why, ladies and gentlemen, that the world has gone with Lucifer and thousands of years ago handed down in family traditions and in secret societies, in masonry and and elsewhere, generation after generation after generation. It's the nod wink of every prominent family. It works. There's wealth, there's power. There's a sense of direction a sense of pride and a profound lack of guilt. And life is wonderful, of course, until it isn't. (laughs) And then, of course, the justification is uh, what they've told me is, look, Zeph, it's too late for us to turn back now. I believe, I believe, I believe we're falling in love. No, it's it's too late... (laughs) They've passed the point of no return. You said it yourself. When you read the passage of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you said it yourself. We've, we believe that Lucifer is good. 
and that the evils upon the earth is Yahweh messing with it and that people had it backwards. So you see, even though bad things will be happening and we may be required to conduct bad things in the name of our birthright, it is for the greater good in the end. And so we will stay the course. We have generations of tradition, of higher learning, art and philosophy, architecture and technology. All of this was built by Lucifer, all of it. None of it was inspired by Yahweh, none of it. So I ask you, who is enjoying all of it and all the technology, enjoying having your own computers that will enable you to have a, a, a what would be a very technical commercial studio in your own home. Who made that possible? And then I think if you're honest, you'll have your answer. Now, I know I'm scaring you. I'm just telling you that is what the devil's advocate or the advocates of the devil or the advocate himself, the ultimate advocate, the ultimate attorney. That is exactly the way it would go down in the courtroom, ladies and gentlemen. Exactly. And if I presented that argument before a jury, I should have been a lawyer. You know, I've missed my calling. Good friend of mine's a lawyer, and I just always, you know, and I, I always like lawyers. I, I haven't had the thing, and lawyers are bad. I've always, you know, in, enjoyed their, their intelligence, for one thing. You know, cases and court cases, and, you know, you can, you, it brings all this philosophy and all these ideas to bear. I mean, you know, there's probably a lot of scumbag, I mean, you know, we know there's a lot of scumbag lawyers. The greatest one was on character in Breaking Bad. He was just terrible. Just a terrible, terrible guy. But, uh, hey, you know, we got those here. And uh, the billboards, when you go through Albuquerque, you see the, the Saul, uh, the Saul's up there, you know. Um, yeah, n not all the time. They're, 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 they're uh, it's just very interesting. Anyway, that would be the argument that I would launch. I would, I, I would actually uh, state unequivocally that, and I would prove beyond all doubt that the Renaissance is the work of Lucifer, the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, the, um, that had, had it been left to Yahweh, we'd be the Bedouins in the desert and there would be no civilization. And I would contend that all the people who are dependent upon that civilization or inspired by it would thus in, in, be candidates to follow Lucifer if he only had a good reputation. And I would, I would present the case better than Mick Jagger in Sympathy for the Devil. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring out the stick. I would only bring out the carrot. The carrot is all I would need. And then I would bring out the truth of this phrase, and I would quote the words of God, and I'd prove beyond all doubt that Yahweh is a mean psychopathic killer that is that uh, expects man to be something that he is not, and when he acts in the way of his own nature, he's punished so severely that it causes insanity and that no civilization could be born of Yahweh. I would then make the case that most people, Christian, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, are really Luciferians, uh, only in secret. And I would say that the true goal of Luciferianism is to bring Lucifer to earth as the savior for real and light up the love of mankind and progress and, and onto the stars and advancement in all these areas of higher learning and philosophy and hope and goodness. A new world order, <laughs> you can hear George H.W. saying, heralding my remarks, doubling down on them, and saying, and you know, praise God. Praise Jesus, Lucifer reigns. Do, am I making myself a little bit 
scary. I just want to show you what you face. The, hey, welcome to the NFL. I, you know, I used to be able to say that. Now it's Pussyville. But, you know, it's, actually it's not Pussyville, but they're trying to make it into that. But welcome to the, the uh, NFL. Welcome to your first day of Navy SEALs training. Okay? A shame how they were used in the field on the fake Bin Laden raid and then, and then wasted like that. Can you imagine being the people responsible, being, say, the, like the president? Can you imagine calling the parents and saying, well, he served with distinction. It's really sorry to see his loss. It was just such a horrible fluke that all those died. Can you, can you imagine being part of the group that you know, made it happen and then to call the parents with a straight face? Can you imagine... And the answer is, <clears throat> he can do that because he sees a greater future. He sees a greater good. We couldn't have it that people would find out that if Bin Laden had been dead already and the boogeyman was dead and then this was all a psyop to make the, pu the stupid public believe that he was gotten there when there was no proof and then they disposed of the body in a manner that could not be inspected to cover everything up. It was pretty obvious. I already knew that he had passed on, and I, I had a Fox News article that, uh, that just was matter-of-factly stating that Bin Laden had, had died of, I think it was kidney failure in 2001 or, or whatever, and um, that that's the end that he came to. Despite that evidence, and despite the fact that the body was, um, uh, uh, the evidence was um, gotten rid of right before the public's eye, the public, <clears throat> they counted on the public's stupidity. And, um, and then you have the cover-up guys, you know, the O'Reilly's and the Sean Hannity's, all these people who they count on, you know, for the, for the, for the people that might look into it as a conspiracy to cover it up. On the left, you don't have to worry about anybody because they, they all just take it at face value. And so they gave, um, and then they came up with some footage and, and, and you know, that kind of, uh, it, it was just such a shoddy mess. And, and, but the saddest thing was to see these young men lose their lives because of politics, gosh, oh boy. I know that uh, ass our assets get wasted all the time for, for even less reasons than that, but to, see, to, to have these highly trained SEALs, to waste those, I mean, and then to not even be talking about it, you know. It, I mean, I'll, I'll just live with it, you know, live with what I know. No one will ever convince me otherwise. And um, uh, n what the more they do try to go out, out, down spot, of course, the more, attention they draw to it but I know what happened you know just like I know what happened on, on all these incidents and it doesn't surprise me I'm just sorry I'm very sorry for the parents I'm very sorry for those kids they had a rude awakening into the way the world works but I'm even more mystified by people that whose hand is on the tiller of the the hand of power uh, and, and who these things happen and they're fine with it. That is a scary thought. Okay. Now, obviously, the, the problem that you have in Genesis 6 where it says, and the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing and the fowls of the air for it, for it you know, grieves me, repenteth me, for it, for it upsets me that I have ever made them. including um, animals. I think you can say animals in general, all the animals. It, re it repents me that I made any of it. I'm sorry I made the whole thing. But that is not God, ladies and gentlemen. And that, those, that's, that's, it's a feebly written thing here, okay? And I'm trying to sh show you something about literature. This is the best we could do to create a an onus on man, that man has a responsibility that, okay, there's the fall, there's the killing of, uh, uh, of Abel, which is, and that story is there also because man kills his brother. When there is a righteous man in the community and the rest are with the devil, let's say, but they all go to church and all that, and the righteous one wants to go to church with them. They kill him 
In other words, they repeat the cosmogony. It's a repetition of the, of the, the rebirth of the world. The birth of the world is manifested by Cain killing Abel. Okay? And so the righteous one, the a-hole, is um, eliminated and destroyed. So that, and, and here's the way it happens. Okay, I'm going to be the murderer now. I'm Cain. You know, well, that, who does he think he is? He has the favor of God, and we, we're sitting over here in our church, and we're, and you know, this is, we can't have this. I just, it, I feel terrible. I feel guilty now. I feel like God hates me. Well, we got to get rid of this one. Once he's out of here, it's back to normal. Okay? And that's how Cain kills Abel and, and, and thus repeats the cosmogony of Lucifer. Count one against the devil. The entire system is based on Cain slaying Abel. This would go for your understanding about government and politics and the news, the press organizations and the war organizations and how they can lie and burn assets and different things and it just goes along like no big deal. Because the basic cosmogony, the basic cosmos, the basic cosmological aspect of truth of this situation we're in is Cain, the highest act of uh, a paradigmatic act is Cain killing Abel because that becomes emblematic of the world. If you want to succeed in this world, ladies and gentlemen, in a big way, you must be Cain and not Abel. Cain wins in this world, in this world system. Abel loses. Don't be a fool. Cain wins. Abel loses. The people of, 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 of Abel would say, one day my Lord is coming for me and he's going to put all you Cainites down and establish justice and goodness for once. And the, the Cain people say, not so fast. Doesn't look like it's happened last century. Hasn't happened this one. So when's your precious God going to uh, return? Kahihi, kahihi. Scary? And so Samuel Beckett comes up with a play called Waiting for Godot, in which they wait for someone named Godot. And they wait, and they wait, and they wait. I believe it's a one-act play. I don't think you could carry it on for three acts because the punchline of it is that Godot never shows up. Actually made quite a, quite a nice play. It had a certain ring of truth to it. Oh, why was it called Godot? Oh, you mean G-O-D with an O-T on it to make it more like a person, but it was really Godot, God. Waiting for a God who never shows up. So what do you expect humanity to do? Your instruction is quite clear from my reading of the word here. It's quite clear what happened here. I don't believe that I would be in shock had I had a Bible teacher that would teach it the way that I've tried to teach myself here, or not tried, have succeeded. And by looking at it the way that I have using my brain, I would start to ask all these questions. I would start to debate the two sides back and forth, recognizing there are two ways to go, recognizing there are two pathways, recognizing the, the, the aspects of each. I would have to tell my son or my daughter that if you go this way, the way of Cain, you will probably succeed and it will be covered. Your evil deeds will not, you, you will not serve one day in jail, that is for sure. Someone without that covering of Cain would. Don't be a fool. Don't throw your life away. 
Now, we must cut all the way up in time and read from this passage. And I believe that eventually, you know, you're going to just stop from, from, from concluding anything right now, please. We're on a, and we're exploring together. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, oh, you know this passage, but I want to read it again in context of what we're talking about. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we call um, Jesus God, so we're denying God. It's also Yahweh would work there. Of course, they don't, they don't, they, they make a distinction, but I'm, how can you? I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed them that did not believe. I know this is even more horrifying, isn't it, in context? And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains and under darkness under the judgment of the great day. Even Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and even speak evil, it doesn't say even, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but that which they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. Well unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots on your feast of charity. We understand who these are. I'm just giving you the other side. These are spots on your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about the, the winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame, foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness and darkness forever. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all, to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking in their own lusts and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage." But beloved, remember you the words that were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you there, were, there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. These be who they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit, capital S. But you, beloved, building yourselves up with the most holy faith, your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a difference, and on others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of the glory of his glory with exceeding joy, to the, on to the only wise God, our Savior, and this is capital G. Jesus is being called a cap God. He's being called God. And then our Savior, 
be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Now, what this chapter should have done is number one, it's a chapter to, to frighten the body into strict obedience to the Lord because any wavering whatsoever could lead to disaster and eternal fire. So, it's kind of a, a prayer and it's an admonition. But what it is more than anything else, it is uh, another proclamation of the identity of Jesus Christ as not only the Savior, but the Creator. It should have been conclusive proof to one who believes the Word of God, as especially those who say it's the infallible. Um, it should have convinced all, but it didn't. There's argument over that. And it goes round and 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 never gets resolved. Therefore, I don't take part in arguments like that because there is no point to it. The other thing is it's not just an admonition. It is beyond that. It is a, a prophetic warning that the Lord will do the same thing with fire that he did to, uh, obviously there was fire, Sodom and Gomorrah was heat and fire. He will do the same thing uh, to the world, so stick close to God our Savior, Jesus, because you don't want to go up in the fire to come. He will return with thousands and thousands of saints to put down the evil and to bring justice to the earth. He's coming for you. Now, thank you, Lord, I receive you. No, that's not allowed now. He's coming in the air, real phys physical being. He'll be here on his throne. He's physically coming. He's physically going to be here, physical. When? Any day now. We've had a prophecy of, of, that was talking about Ebola and all this stuff. So therefore, we're, any, we're very close now. He's going to come and rescue his, his church, his bride, and then he's going to bring a, open a big can of whoop-ass and take care of this evil devil and the Cain people. Make sure that you stay right up, have that way hedged up so that you, you'll be ready. Be like the five wise virgins and be ready for when he comes for you. You don't want to be caught napping. You don't want to be caught sinning. You repent now and make sure you stay holy. For any minute, this thing can happen. And if you get left behind, you'll be tortured and killed probably. It will be a terrible, terrible fate for you. And then the devil comes in and says, I thought the whole idea of Jesus was, you know, that it was a blessing to be a martyr. I mean, I didn't realize that there was such an emphasis on escape. Well, they should have gone with me then because I would give them the ultimate, not escape, but engagement. Production, potentiation, more intelligence, leadership positions, growth, family and generational sustenance. Where is this God that will return? and set it right. Now, of course, I'm being somewhat facetious, but and, and, and really the real truth of it is, we pull back the curtain on what Luciferianism is and Satanism is and all that. We see all manner of, um, that, that it's just a front, promising the kind of the George H.W. Bush speech about the New World Order and the Thousand Points of Light, promising all this on the front, but in the back end, uh, when we see the way the sausage is made, it's pure evil continually and pure wickedness and pure pain and suffering and torture with an aim, mind you, to destroy the human race, to actually eliminate it if possible from the earth. And some of the advocates, some of the Satanists that are, have prominent voices, such as Prince whatever and um, whoever, you know, how they, various professors, how they said, I hope this virus gets out and kills everybody or I come back as a virus 
and uh, you know, and able to kill ninety nine percent of the people on Earth or whatever. That that so they they've actually gotten you know um, indoctrinated even to that point, to where they are overtly waging a war against humanity for the eradication thereof, including the eradication of the fowls of the, of the things that Yahweh said here, the fowls of the air every creeping thing, every plant, even the planet itself, to destroy it so that it can never breed life again. Because life itself is evil. Yes, granted, it was created by Yahweh. For what? So he could torture it. No, we're going to eradicate it from all, all matter because we have the technology to do so. The only thing holding us back is that it is God who intervenes. <coughs> Excuse me. Who intervenes, who stops our nuclear wars, who stops our plagues, this is who stops the SARS virus, the H one N one, the various things, eradicates these things, who makes it a life where we cannot get done what we need to get done. So here's what we're going to do. We are now going to wage a war against God's people because there are more of them, it looks like. A lot of them are here in America. So we're going to wage war against the citizens because the God-fearing are sown amongst them. And so we'll eradicate them all in the hopes of getting those that belong to the Lord. We will wage a war like no war has ever been because we will be rewarded handsomely for getting rid of the children of the Most High God. <laughs> and so you watch them doing just that. And people, Why did they do that? Why did they do this? Why did they do that? Why are they doing this? It's, like, it's very simple if you know the answers to the motivation of your characters. You've got to know that when you're a screenwriter or a novelist. You have to know, well, what's driving that person who you've created? That's what's driving them is the need to eradicate humanity from the face of the earth and eradicate all matter and form. I mean, that's at the base, the root basis of it. So therefore, it's fair game. You know, the, the, uh, the reins have been lifted off. It's a free-for-all. And they are intent on destroying the children of Yahweh, sown amongst the people. And they don't care about burning their own assets, as you, know, you understand that. That's all part of their sacrificial cult anyway. And, um, you know, that's what they're doing. I, I don't know what the mystery, what, what's the mystery to you? I've explained why Mun was, you, you know, we have a number of issues going here. Number one, we're looking at this chapter in Genesis um, 6, 5. N numero uno, okay? And we're, we're trying to, without losing faith, we're trying to deepen our faith by saying, by questioning the Bible, and when it says this, I'm sorry that I created man and beast. I'm sorry that I created man and animals. I'm, I'm sorry I made them, so I'm going to destroy them. I will keep Noah, but I will destroy them. And I will come back and destroy them again with fire in the end. And I, I'm just going to destroy them continually. And I have to keep repeating myself, but they keep going their own way, so I will destroy them. They go the way that I've programmed them to go, and they, so I will destroy them. They said yes to something they weren't supposed to say yes to, so I will destroy them. They, they got their hand in the cookie jar when I told them to go ahead and put their hand in the cookie jar. Then they did, and then I punished them. So, me thinks, when I'm looking at Genesis, that, there's, that there is definitely a conspiracy to use this Bible in a, in a very mean-spirited and negative way by the so-called churches, so-called, quote, 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 and taken very lightly. That they would use this idea of this mean, punishing father, present him as love, and tell people to obey and to be sure you come to them when you sin and confess. 
oh, you had an urge, oh, and you, well, you better come in here and tell me all about it. And thus exert control over man that is otherwise a brute beast himself, out of control, reckless and disgusting. Um, the devil has had an easy time recruiting the world based on what's written right here. And then, of course, the most glaring thing, and this is what gets me removed from the church scene, is when I say, well, if God is God, he knows everything, he knows all the past and the future and everything that's going to happen, why, why not just not create man in the first place? Why create man and say that you, it repents you? That's a lie. I'm calling it a lie. That is not the way God thinks, and that's not a characterization of God. But it's a great um, poster child for Lucifer in terms of recruitment after reading that. No, no, no. The problem is not that he's you know mean and punishes and all that. And, and, and uh, the, the problem is in the creation. In other words, he created something that would do just what he created and, and, that, w and that would do what he knew what would happen. Then he says, I, I'm, I'm grieved that I created man, as if this is a fluid situation and that he's not fully up on, to speed on what's going on. The, the Garden of Eden is even more horrifying. Genesis 6-5 is completely disingenuous and even more horrifying. So it must be taught to children properly, to not, not tell children to turn their mind off. Do you realize that if you, if you, if you take the dichotomy within your psyche, Meaning, you know, you've got, it's the, the issue I brought up to here today is never addressed. And you just blindly accept, yes, uh-huh. Do you know that that makes you insane? Do you know that there's a, a, a thing called cognitive dissonance or a disconnection from reality that takes place? Do you realize that that also causes a split personality and thus far easier to control? Do you know that it's like an abusive parent you know how you get abused? Well, those of you who've been abused, you know how you can be abused and then everyone covers it up at dinner or pretends it gets swept under the rug over and over again and you're asked about your parents, you say, I love them and never gets addressed how that comes up as a mental illness later on. You understand what I'm talking about? Well, this, this, is, this is one of the most dangerous um, things to do would be to tell a child who's very impressionable that to tell them this is, this is the inerrant word of God, it's the truth, it's perfect. And then as he has questions about the imperfections of it, to tell him to shut the F up. Do you realize that has destroyed a great deal of people and that most of them have gone with Lucifer even though they still go to Bible study and do their church thing, okay? Do you realize it's the greatest recruiting tool that the devil could ever have? You would be better off not knowing. I, it's just a simple question. If God knows, l let me just do it again so that you understand that I am completely accurate and, and, and oh well, you know. God knows what man would choose. He didn't put a blindfold on. He knows everything that's going to happen or has happened at, at, through time because he invented time. So he made man a certain way and then he said, boy, it really repents me that I made man. And by the way, I'm going to throw the animals in too that didn't do anything. Because, you know, I'm just mad. Okay. Now, my question as, a, as an eight-year-old would be, you know, um, why is that if God knows everything and would he then create man? Why, why not just not create man? Because we couldn't have the whole rest of the story unless he did and unless man did exactly what he did. This book, the Bible, wouldn't even exist. Now, it doesn't bother me that there's an issue here that, that the, the writing is, is such that does not describe God. You know, this is, right? I mean, that it makes no sense. I'm fine because I know God exists. 
I have had to look at this critically and, and, and be a critical reader, as I was taught to do, because I, I have had an education. I, you know, a part of it was self-education through reading lots of books, but I, I went through that period of my life. And I thank God I did, because it gave me the ability to critically think. I said to, to when, I, when I had to get a, uh, I, my life was interrupted, so I couldn't, I didn't finish high school, so I had to I'd go make it up with a, a GED, and I had a teacher to get a GED, I remember. And um, she asked us all in the class, you know, what was our, it was, it was, it was, I won't even describe the alternative kind of thing that I was in. But um, she asked the class, you know, well, what is, what do you want out of all this? Because we were looking at history, we were looking at, you know, because we're going to have to pass a GED test, right? So we had to really kind of cram and learn all this stuff that you're supposed to get over four years of high school or three years, whatever it is. Anyway, um, and I told her, I remember, and then she mentioned it to the class or she mentioned it to the, uh, to somebody later. She remembered what I said. I said, I want to learn how to think. And then after that, I went to, you know, I, I was able to, to, to find my way into a junior college and then eventually a college. And, and I got really inspired by the history of religions and um, I couldn't get enough of it. And that's all I wanted to do until I found out that there was, you know, there was obviously a price for the, right, for graduate school. They want you to be a certain way. And, you know, you know me, that's people try to shape me into something. It's like, uh, okay, you know, the stall gets killed, kicked down, and I'm going to run, run, you know. I can't, I'm sorry. I'm just not civilizable. But I did learn through teachers and even through that one on a, on a silly GED thing, just wanting to complete that uh, because my, um, I was taken out of school because I had problems, you know, so I, I couldn't finish because I had problems. I was boy interrupted. Not all my fault, some of my fault, but I mean, you know, you're going to blame, you know, what, a 16-year-old, it's all your fault? I mean, you know, I had problems, Okay. Not of my own making, but just, you know, I'm a certain kind of person and um, much like the abuse here in the Bible. Now, imagine me teaching children, impressionable, say they're 10 or 12 or 13, and some of them might even ask questions between their texting and whatnot. Um, and I'm, and, and, you know, they ask me a question about this and I tell them this is the inerrant word of God and it's perfect. I've created a whole batch of Luciferians because that's how it will manifest if unaddressed. Now, here's the way I read it, okay? Um, God is showing through man and writing through man, through in this case, possibly Abraham, um, you know, uh, but uh, obviously this is part of the Pentateuch and, 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 and uh, the first five books of, uh, you know, the books of Moses and the first five books and you know it, it, it's um, it's you know there's a lot of argument about the authorship of it but it, I think most scholars agree that it's written in a very um, kind of basic format kind of not really literary and and I believe this is used to teach people about the person God is with an emphasis on instead of going wild be, oh, being, being obedient and man putting his hand a little too far into it, making God unaware of time and space, you know, like he's like us, kind of looking ahead, not one knowing what's going to happen. And I believe this is the flaw of, of this. And then further in, you know, we get in um, further chapters, we get uh, we have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, um, uh, uh, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? So that's the Pentateuch, and it, a lot of it is instruction on keeping the people together, keeping the people, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and the, you know, the rules for, for society and the, and the rules, which, by the way, nobody could follow, and nobody could follow the Ten Commandments, and sin grew, it looked like, all the more, plus, not, on, not only that, but there was just a great, um, you know, evil grew tremendously with the yoke of the Ten Commandments and the, and the slaying of the, 
of the people. It's not that they didn't believe, as it says in the book of Jude. It's not that they didn't believe. It's that they worshiped the golden calf, meaning, you know, the, the truth of all of this inspired them to become Luciferian. I mean, call them pagan or call them whatever you want. But anyway, you know, they're whooping it up and having their orgies and while dancing around the, 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 the firelit golden calf that's glowing in the dark and they're, and they're having a, a gay old time. And, um, and here comes evil Boses and just decides to kill them all. Now, mind you, they didn't murder anybody. He said God told him to do it. Another, mar an, another, put another one in the column for Lucifer. That incident of psychopathically killing 3,000 people or however many it was. Because they were dancing around the golden calf and having an orgy. Because they were all pent up. Because that's what they want. That's what their loins were telling them to do. Whatever. And they went with their base instincts. Sure, they did. And then they were slain for it. Because we can't have disobedience. And then when you agreed that mass murder is <clears throat> okay because it has to do with breaking God's rules, this God here who doesn't know what he's doing, sort of making it up as you go along. In truth, they were disobedient toward Moses. They weren't going to follow Moses. There was already dissent in the ranks, so the idea was to, you know, if they're not going to follow along, we're going to kill them. Now, that's what happened. It came from on high that unless Moses killed them, all would be lost because God would punish all of them. No, because God already said uh, to, to in, in the beginning, God said that if there is more than 50 righteous, he wouldn't nuke the city. Applying the same logic we should then contend that obviously if there's, you know, 25,000 righteous, 3,000 non, that according to God's rules, or he wouldn't, whether there, it doesn't matter where, where the, the order of occurrence here, God is not progressive. So it doesn't matter, you know, he, he would never change. Uh, then they would not be slain at the word of God. There would be another discrepancy. So here's my lawyer mind finding yet another discrepancy. I'm not a murmurer. I'm not a backbiter. I'm not a complainer. I'm saying that there's a discrepancy that God would kill them all in this instance and then not kill them and, and all the more righteous and not kill them in the instance of, um, of Sodom, according to Abraham, who inquired of the Lord. Now, certainly, that should produce a question in the mind of any seeking child. What is the pastor going to tell them? That's right. It's perfect. It's the word of God. It's an errand. Just shut up and accept it, and you'll be okay. Jesus will answer all your questions. These are questions that man cannot answer. Wrong. These are questions that man must answer or create a civilization based on a mental illness, based on a lie playing right into guess who guess whose hands no wonder most of the church people are luciferians right with the kind of teaching they get no wonder you see the case that's been made it's like 90, 90 over on lucifer's side one or two on god's side i mean it's it's like 90 to 2 devil just kills it he wins every time so i'm hoping that this little talk will help you to understand the world you live in a little bit better. This kind of thing, taking these scriptures and not answering you know, our kids' questions is turning them to Satan, whether you know it or not, and destroying an entire generation. This is far more dangerous than indoctrinating someone into drugs or prostitution or whatever, a life of crime. This is, this is actually even more dangerous. It's justifiable, um, you know, to, to look at, you know, you know, here would be the question. Dad, how come God destroyed, you know, one of the 3,000 killed and, 
in the wilderness, and he was he he would kill all of them when the the ratio was different with Sodom. Uh, Hamana, Hamana, just believe it. It's it's all true because God made change his mind. He 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 was he was trying to eradicate the uh, apostates, and that's the only way he could do it. At you know to threaten them all. So so that's you know he he uh, ordered them all killed. Okay, let's cut to another one. God tells Abraham to take Isaac. I mean, you know, uh, to, to Mount Moriah and um, do the deed of killing his son. Uh, um, I um, just taking a little. I just wonder what I'm going to say about this because I I don't know if I want to open up. Uh, um, do I want to get into this about Abraham and? Isaac. Okay. Um, let, yeah. Um, you know, as a test to see how much faith you had if you're willing to sacrifice your own beloved son, which is also a, a precursor to Jesus, right? It's, it's, like, a, it's like a teachable moment. And um, the sacrifice was because God wanted it, and that's all, all anyone needs to know. It doesn't matter why God wants it. It's because when God tells you to do something, you do it and you don't question it. It's really the Satanist or the Luciferian who uses the brain to use reason and logic. Another one, in the, right? Therefore, by, by, our, by this argument, the Christian who's accepted all this and all this discrepancy, and, and yes, they're making me, they're not allowing me, I hate people like this. Um, and God said, take your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there on the, as, a, as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Um... So your only son and, um, you know, and, and, uh, and the firstborn whom you love and, uh, you know, the, the burnt offerings were the way that uh, sacrifices w were made. So I want you to sacrifice your only, your only begotten son. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it, that's the way it's, it's taught that, that God lost his only begotten son for the sake of the world to save it, that through belief in Jesus Christ, you would indeed be saved. But what does belief mean? Belief means following. Jesus has never told me to not use my brain or logic or common sense. I believe in God. I believe that Jesus is my savior but since Jesus is the creator, then the creator is my savior, just like David, you know, in the Psalms. So I have no problem with, with all that. I have no problem thinking critically that the, the mistake in the way God was characterized in the Pentateuch is the mistake of the writers and not, you know, it's not God's fault. But it must be explained to people Indeed, it would be a, a, a fallacy and a great mistake to base a religion. From, okay, let's go to Leviticus. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, or wherever it is, Deuteronomy. It's in the Pentateuch, okay? God shall not, su you shall not suffer. If you see witches, you burn them at the stake. And then the people did that. Jesus, despite Jesus' teaching, it used to be an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, but now it's based on love and, you know, 
were not going to. But that didn't stop them from uh, burning the lambs. All right, because the witches are always the lambs, the innocent ones who are not, right, who are not part of the system. They're the ones that get burned at the stake and accused of being witches. <laughs> oh, no, it's a joke being here on Earth. I, I have to tell you, I, I'm trying to take it seriously, but it's just, it's almost impossible. I, I've, I've really tried to take it seriously, all the drama about this and that and the drama about the next war and the drama here. I, I don't care what happens, really, you know. It's just, I've gotten to the point where I'm, I'm it repenteth me that I was brought here. For what reason? What's, what... What on earth would I want with this place? I try to make the best of it. There's my wife complaining that I'm talking like this. But um, I've tried to make the best of it. I've tried to, you know, I've, I was innocent for a long time, you know. I kept my innocence intact, even though it cost me a lot. What is that? Was that you, Trish? Oh, that's Eli. I heard that tail thumping of yours, Eli. Okay, so I've, I've tried to keep my innocence intact for a long time, meaning I would not believe in this. I, I knew that when I was a boy, because of being abused, I knew the satanic thing, you know what I mean? It, 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 was, it wasn't just abuse, it was like, you know, ritual and... You know, that they were serious, you know what I mean? And, and then I got myself booted out of there. And, you know, you'd be, you should cheer me on. I got booted out of everything so I, because I wouldn't, you know, I, was, I, I knew that that was wrong. <laughs> and, then, and then some kid tries to drown me. Then, then my life became in danger. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's terrible. It's terrible what I know. But I can say this, that um, I, I'm just talking about society, polite society. So I wouldn't believe what I'd see. I thought I'd relegate it to the realm of um, exotica. And, you know, it's just like all the abuse that occurred in, 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 in our you know, family. Nobody ever talked about it. It was all swept under the rug. So I swept all that under the rug. And we all did. And then everything was fine. And, and psycho. Um, so I did, you know, I... I, I for a long time, I had the world as a certain way, like what you see on television. And, you know, I wouldn't give in to the idea that there's this other world, you know, juxtaposed with ours, that you've got to be into, that they're trying to groom us to be a part of so that we can um, live. I mean, it basically comes down to that. I, that. That's their total belief system. Now, all these people were churchgoers, all. Right, so, and, and, and if they're Jewish, they're temple goers. All. All. All were good people. All were law abiding citizens. All and many. Many are Bible teachers who, who were there in those, quote, rituals. Today, they are leaders in, the, in religion, politics, teachers in prominent universities. They're owned lock, stock, and barrel by Satan and were from childhood and brought up in Christian schools and Christian homes, raised to lead. And you wonder, how did you get that position? How did you wind up there? And there's only one answer to that. They were appointed that position by you know who, the God of this world. And that's basically the sad, awful truth about the whole thing. There's nothing really more to know than that. I don't want to get into any of the details. I do not like 
I don't like their killings. I don't like I don't like the killings of the of the three thousand and and not going by the logic of Sodom. You know those kind of things bother me. In other words, whoever the writers were, screwed up. I believe the Bible is in, in the inspired word of God to someone that has the Holy Spirit, obviously. But then again, so is the phone book. So is a comic book. So, no, I do not believe that the Bible is the inerrant word of God. Absolutely not. And it's unless you believe God is stupid. Then if you believe God is stupid, then fine, you can have your word of God. I believe that the word of God must be gleaned from the text and inspired within you to speak to you. Otherwise, why read the Old Testament uh, history stories over and over again? What would be the point of that? If, you know, here would be my child again. Dad, if God is all good and all love, why would he want uh, Abraham to kill his only begotten son that he loved? Now, I know the official answer and the official um, commentary, I should say, because what we have today is like 10,000 times more commentary than we do actual Bibles. So I understand the status quo commentary. See, the way I would teach it, say if you want to do a non-biblical teaching to your kids, and I would teach it like this, what goes around comes around. <laughs> That'd be the basis of all my teaching. You know, the choices you make will also determine results that will happen. So if you make good choices, like I believe in working, um, even if I'm not working for someone else, but I believe that, that in the work ethic, I work very hard at what I do, meaning I will put in the time and the effort and, 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 and to, to do what I do, sound engineering, mixing, you know, all that stuff that goes on is, you know, some days, 12, 15 hours, you know and a little bit of sleep and then add it again until the problem is solved and then constantly coming up with more projects. I mean, you may not think much of them, but to come up with a song is a, it's a, it's about 100 hours of work in a week and then you do two or three and you do more and you keep going and keep going. The hours add up because I know it pleases the Lord that I, that I work at, at, at what he has given me to work at and then these and producing these. You know, the whole thing adds up to I'm not really on vacation too much. I mean, I do, I do travel, but when I travel, I work as well. Um, but it's, it's work that I don't necessarily enjoy it. I'm exercising a gift that, that God's given me. And I'm just saying like in the studio, if I didn't put all the hours in that I did, and, and I mean, we're thousands and thousands and thousands of hours. Had I not done that, I would, it, I would not be, uh, I would not understand how to, there are many people that have a studio that just don't ever learn how to use it. I would not know how to use it. I have to learn how to use it. And I have to then implement uh, a plan and a strategy. And then I have to also come up with, but I don't believe in having idle days. I believe that every day there should be some work done and, and, and maybe not on the Sabbath, but there should be some work done. I think the Sabbath is for sharing the word because the, the temples are open on the Sabbath. So work does go on of a certain nature. That is God's business. But I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, I've, I've believed in that and the Bible talks about that. And, you know, what's interesting is I never apologize. I never feel really bad after a full day where it's gone from, say, three in the morning till five in the afternoon or six. And then I finally knock off. You know, I can't go any further. I just am exhausted. But it, it does. There's a feeling of, of, of that you've accomplished something. And, um, you know, I've had to kind of buy my bootstraps, bring myself up in terms of, of, of skill that I didn't have and knowledge of engineering that I didn't have in a very hard field and very difficult to, to, to move, you know, beyond. And it's just in, in right now I'm in a tremendous learning curve as, as well with, with this equipment. And, um, but at the end of the day, it, there's a certain feeling that you've, you've done something, you know, I, I don't believe in letting days go by because I just, without work, I, I, I some people say, well, what you're doing is not work. It's, and it's like, yeah, it really is. It really is. 
it's as much as you know writing a book or um, you know creating something that that is to be shared. It it may not have a commercial value because the world is 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 what the way it is. I can't make the world different. I'm doing it for the Lord. But I'm doing the work that He wants me to do, and it's a daily thing, and it and it's it's always on. You know, and it's very many hours, far more than than any any job that I've had or any full time job. Far more, far far more hours, far more sweat. In fact, at times the the studio. You know, it smells like a gymnasium because it's just it's just a lot of time to to learn a tiny bit of stuff, a, a couple little things. Yeah, but no complaining on this end because I'm doing it as I said for the Lord because He threw all threw me into the deep end of the pool with this. I have no idea why. I'm just I'm just using. It. I never had a desire to have any of this stuff. I and I still don't. That's the weird thing, you know. There are people that they just they drool over this stuff. I'm like, well, I don't. I feel it's abstract. Like I could just walk away from it. It's just it's just a, a work with a shed with a bunch of tools in it, and I do this work for the Lord anyway. So I'm motivated to do that. The point being, because the Lord has shown me that He's given me the spirit of that, and I've always worked at things, you know, in that way. Whether you know, I always worked hard, and you know, whether it was no matter what it was. And there's always been a feeling of, you know, I've always been a survivor, I think, because of that. And I think I've come to conclusions, you know, not conclusions, but questions and and, and ponderings based on the fact that the Lord has blessed me because he blesses those that that work. And I think... um, it's just part of the, you know, I mean, you know, I've got a guy that he, he put, he builds, you know, the, the, he does stone mason work here. And we have stones all over the place and we, we put them around, you know, to strengthen wood, all kinds of things. And I go, yeah, I, yeah, I'm really working hard. It's up at two. And he starts laughing, <laughs> you know, oh, that ain't working. You know, it's like the song. And uh, yeah, but I've been in there for, I could have been uh, traveling. I could have been, uh, you know, doing a whole bunch of things. I don't have to be here practically falling asleep at my desk or crying because I can't do something. But anyway, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, I think he, he also recognizes that it is an intense pursuit. Involving, I don't know, I don't know, there's no retirement. It just it just never ends. It just you just you just die, I guess, or, or you or you or you get uh, moved on. Anyway, um, I want to get back to the point. So I just picked out a couple of points, and and uh, I also showed how the um, the when God asked on the on the on, you know is God mean because He wanted Abraham to sacrifice the son? No, because God knew when He said that that it was a test because He already knew that um, He would call it off. But it was a, to teach future generations about the way God is. Some things are a test like Abraham and Isaac, where, you know, God wants you to um, not be concerned about, you know, how something will look or not and just go be yourself or whatever it is. And then, you know, you, you think they'll all jump on you. And let's say, and at the last minute he says, no, you can go ahead and comb your hair like they do or put on the kind of clothes they wear or whatever. And so you don't have to be a, a, an outcast. I just wanted, you know, it's a test. W- would you be that if I asked you? And I think that is what I would tell a child. And, and um you know, I would also point to the idea of, of some having compassion for, you know, sacrificing your only son for the purpose of saving the world. But in, in essence, God, you know, this is another, you know, story of God's love for humanity, proving it. And the way God sort of works, the way he, you know, he allowed the word here, he knew what this Bible would be. But it's because it, it will teach people if taught correctly. I mean, you can't tell people to turn their brains off. You can't tell k- kids not to ask questions about the Lord. I mean, why would he do this? 
if in Sodom he only did that many, why would he have these 3,000 killed? Wasn't this just really because they weren't following, because not because they were whooping it up with the golden calf, it was because they were not being obedient to Moses. Isn't that more true to the, the picture? And the answer to that is correct. That's, that's correct. And then it was justified in the Bible. So you have to temper that a little bit. All I'm saying is I would be a fool to overlook those things and then become later in life mentally ill or a useless automaton because, uh, because of blind obedience to some one's teaching that tells me it's perfect when I know it's not. And I know the Pentateuch is not per perfectly written. And, it's, it's, it, and I know that, that a lot of what's in the Bible is, is to teach people things and to guide them in behavior. But I also know that I would teach my child, I, and I hope I have, what goes around comes around. So what you want to do with people, you know, what you want to do with your life is you want to, you know, and learn other things that God, if you get in concert with the Lord and the things he wants, which you can glean from the Bible. And, you know, the basic, you know, it kind of rubs off on you in that way about, you know, hard work, honesty, integrity, principles, all these things that should be common sense, by the way. Um, there will be rewards. You know, you will be guided. If you ask God for guidance, he's going to guide you. He's there. He's a living being. But he also knows um, that he would create and that he would destroy and that he would do all manner of things. And he knows everything that he would do, everything that man will do, everything that anything will do, front and back, top to bottom, and, and, and around and around. He knows all those things. So you can't fool the children by telling them that God doesn't know where Adam is in the garden. God doesn't know that the, uh, the man will, will act up. God doesn't know that Cain will be the one that's revered. I mean, and God protected Cain, right? So God knew. Cain is the way of the world. Abel is not. You know, Lucifer is the way of the world. Jesus is not. It's just that simple. You know. um, corruption is the way of the world. Righteousness is not. If God wanted it to be righteousness, he could have had it at any time he wanted. All he would have to have done is made man with more of an appetite for righteousness rather than corruption, which he didn't do. So, you know, please go back to your source if you don't answer those questions, ladies and gentlemen, your children will become Satanists. I mean, they will go, they will figure it out. They'll have that debate at some point in their life. And they'll go, wow, it's just kind of a no-brainer here. So we, when we ask, well, why is the whole world so wicked? Why don't you look in the mirror? That's what I'm having to do. It's because we screw up. We tell our kids to turn their brains off and not ask these questions. We tell them to have blind obedience. And then we wonder why when they're given orders to shoot a whole bunch of people, they, you know, or, or gear up with Homeland Security to go shoot American citizens or whatever, Americans on Americans violence, that they're more than willing to do it. It's not like there are any who won't. They all will. Why is that? Let's go back to the Bible and the teacher. Let's go, let's go back to abuse in the home. Let's go back to covering things up. And that's why they will. You say, well, they're psycho. Yes, they're all psychos. So therefore, they're normal. I rest my case. You can't, you can't beat me on this. Um, you know, I, 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 there's a million more texts I could point to. I, I mean, there's a million more. I'm not even going by the thing of, you know, there's sites that have flaws. In the Bible. I'm not even looking at flaws or mistakes. I'm looking at the basic who is God? And is God stupid? Well, I'm sorry, I made man. I just, you know, I made man. I had hopes for the best, but look what happened. Really? Of course you don't believe that. But you've been going along with all this, and that's how some of you get caught up in the rapture cults and everything else. Nothing wrong with the rapture. God translates people out all the time. Yeah, all the time. As per his, you know, Enoch is not an isolated event. 
It's appointed to man to die. One day. Uh, yeah, I know. You want to argue with that scripture, but we know about translation. We know that th that happens. We know Paul talked about it. We know it's not just transportation, but sometimes translation out. We understand that 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 um, there are stories of people who who th they disappeared. No one knows where they went, and it's suspected that maybe God took them. And um, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't. I believe the Enoch incident was a teach of, uh, teaching uh, moment. And what happened with Elijah? Same thing. At these beings, if they were taken, they're going to have to come back here and die according to God's rules. God cannot lie. Oh, well, it's a it's a lie about how he didn't know that where Adam was. It's a lie that he didn't know uh, that man would act up as he has. That's all a lie. So what do you what you know? What's your point? It's a lie that he didn't go along with the rules of Sodom and Gomorrah when when applying it to the uh, Moses in the wilderness with the uh, golden calf incident. Uh, that's a lie. So what else, what else? You know, you want me to go down the list? There, there are thousands of them. So if I accept all this blindly, and the ultimate biggest lie and the biggest evil going on today, I think, is this waiting for Godot stuff when God is here, within us, around us, everywhere. And yet we blindly go along like he's nowhere and he's way out there somewhere. That was the problem with African primitive religion, that they, they had God as, as distant and not available, so they were on their own, so they went with witchcraft. I mean, hello? So when you screw up on the one hand, you create Luciferians on the other. Through our teaching and our, our Christian heritage here in America, we've created more Luciferians than maybe anywhere on earth, but there's also righteous people here. But the, most of them did not we're not indoctrinated by this stuff. I mean, when we were kids, we were too busy throwing spitballs at the other guy and making jokes, and we never took it any of it seriously. Thank God I didn't. Thank the Lord. Oh, bro, bless you, Father. Thank God I didn't take it seriously. I just thought, you know, the, the Bible was a joke, and, you know, it's just people trying to control people and making stuff up, and, you know. Turns out, yep, I was kind of right on that. They did make stuff up. And I have had to, I guess, have separation from people that believe it's, you know, the perfect, infallible, whatever. They're just like, um, I don't believe they're completely stable. I think they're unstable people. And they have to have this idea that there's this icon that they can believe in that's 100% accurate to try to align with it in order to, you know, be able to get through life without going insane. And I believe that it, maybe it's like a crutch holding them together. And I don't want to take it away from somebody, you know, but... I, I can't just, you can't tell me to read the, you know, I used to, I tried to fit in, look, I tried very hard to fit into the model and the paradigm of the inerrant word of God. I, I struggled with that in the early 2000s and when I was on the air, I was the same thing. And then slowly over time, um, because I was so excited to know the Lord. So most of the time, you know, when I got stuff direct from the Lord, fine. When I got stuff, I would never go straight through. I would never do any teachings like that. I would be gleaning things from the Bible that were inspired at that moment in my own walk. And thank God I did it like that because, um, but I would, you know, I was caught up in this thing that, you know, when something bad would happen, God was judging that place because there's too many people that are wicked. They've, they won't obey the word of God. They should be struck down by thunder. And it's like, no, I, I, you know, the obey the word of God is to obey uh, common sense. It's to obey basic right and wrong. It's to obey basic laws, basic uh, goodness, you know, the laws of goodness of, you know, uh, not hating your neighbor, you know, giving the guy the other chance, you know, doing good works, um, you know, um, uh, you know, giving the shirt off your back to the other guy in a time of need, saving the kid from the train wreck or whatever it is. Um, you know, the good things. And those are all good things that need to be, it's not all wicked all the time, you know, either. So I've had to put the Bible in perspective. I know people are saying, well, why not just drop the Bible? Because the Bible is very important uh, in the, the sense that it is a, uh, a great roadmap to God, for one thing to knowing how he is and how he wants to be seen. He wants to be seen as serious and he wants to be seen as, you know, a lot of this is cause and effect. 
you know, if you do this, then this will happen. It's like a, it's like a, a rule of nature. And God's trying to teach also through fear because he knows that there are people that um, just won't listen unless the jig is up. And that's, that's true. So he's trying to teach with fear that if you do this, I'll do this to you. You know, I think that's valid, but we must put it in context of what, what, what's the point of God was, sorry he made man, he was so wicked in the days of Noah, he's going to destroy all but Noah. What was the point of that? And then, and then, oh, here's another point that I didn't bring up that has been disturbing me lately. Why um, are the Nephilim and the Cainites and everybody um, flourishing after the flood? I think that was the whole point to get rid of them. For the geneticist people out there, you know, so Noah was pure in his genes and so God got rid of all the impure. No, he didn't. Obviously, they're still around. So what the heck uh, was that all about, the flood? That's not answered in the Bible. <laughs> not to my satisfaction. That's something I'm thinking about right now. I don't have anything to say about it yet. But I mean, it does disturb me that if God is perfect and God is God, he wants to eradicate a certain genome or hybrids from the population, then he would have done so in the flood. If that was the goal, he would be 100% successful or he would not be God. Amen. And so he wasn't successful in doing that. So that makes me think that wasn't the goal. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. Otherwise, I'd believe in some falsehood or a lie. If I believe in lies, then eventually I'll be rife for indoctrination and um, recruitment into the world system, which I would then be very compliant and I would be a good God-fearing citizen always in church, doing good charitable works. And then the real underneath story of the kinds of abuses and things that go on, of course, you know, you learn early on to sweep those under the rug and that, that's the way we operate. So I will teach my children lies. I'll teach them not to think, for example, the greatest lie of all not to question reality, not to question authority. I will teach them to go, which is exactly what they want today, isn't it? And it uh, seems to me Christianity is perfect for, for, for raising Nazis. Perfect. Because they learn not to ask any questions. They learn to turn their brains off. They learn to be programmed and they learn to do what they're told. And they're all taught that it's God's will. So they're, they're good people. Um... If you want to write me and tell me to please don't talk about the Bible anymore or bring the name Jesus in or any of those things, I will tell you to do the exact same. You have no right to that Bible and what you teach is nothing but psychotica and you should be quiet. Okay? So right back at you, man. You should be quiet. Do not try to tell me that what I have discerned, which I've also put into the public view for all to see, is um, somehow making something up when it's right there, in glaring black and white, easy for anyone to see. It's like telling me the sun does not come up in the east and it doesn't set in the west. You would tell me that, um, that, uh, that please don't talk about uh, the sun rising in the east and setting in the west because you're making a bad example. You're making people question their faith. No, oh, you, it's better to just blindly accept a book written by man that's told it's an errant so you could be controlled? No, lose your faith so that you can find a new one based on something more true. My faith is not based on the Bible, friends. It's not based on any text of man. It's not based on Moses' stone tablets. It's based on, uh, you, you know, uh, my faith is based on God dealing with me and me dealing with him, a relationship. And in that relationship, God tells me, you know, it teaches me to be obedient. In other words, to not just do whatever I want to do, but rather 
keep that powder dry. Even when I'm cussing too much about things like the, the you know, the political leaders and things like that, when they want to throw a World War Three uh, just for fun and profit, I get, you know, angry. And, and uh, the Lord has been kind of gently nudging me and teaching me and bringing me along. The same thing with other issues of bad habits I've had in the past and all that. And the Lord's instructing me to, okay, now try, now really, you know, try to discipline yourself from doing those things. And, and uh, I, I, I'm being brought along step by step. But I've never been told to kill 3,000 people because um, they don't agree. They're worshiping the golden calf. That sounds more like a political hit. Or, you know, sounds more like ethnic cleansing. Do not expect me to laud that. I'm still pondering that one. I am allowed to think, am I not? There's a lot of things in the Bible to think about. A lot of, lot of things that, you know, if you look with a critical eye, you don't just blow by it and go, oh, I accept, and then on to the next mind control, uh, um, uh, you know, brainwashing aspect. The biggest one is to accept God as um, a flawed psychopathic killer uh, who's a liar, and then accept him as truth and love at, while you're being told to kill 3,000 people because of the golden calf incident or whatever, and then accepting all those stories as gospel truth and love and light um, without examining it, which will then ca be like causing a split in one's personality that will then be make a person split right down the middle, in other words, mentally ill, which will then make the person easy to control by Lucifer. Am I making my point very clear, ladies and gentlemen? You may not agree with it, and that's fine, that's your right. You can be, you know, uh, blind all you want. God gave me a brain, and he gave me basic discernment capabilities and the ability to question something when it doesn't seem quite right to me. Now, you know what's amazing to me about all this? The church keeps on with their doctrines with, with enough plot holes in it you could drive, you know, uh, every train through it a million times. And they keep on with these glaring discrepancies teaching the same thing generation after generation. And people wonder why in America you have no talk about Jesus and you have, you know, an emptying of the churches, which we predicted would happen. And when you get a so-called on-fire preacher going, what are the, what's the first thing they do? They, they, all the discrepancies and all the problems and everything, they didactically salute with Zig Heil. Just, just right off the bat, and then they go, oh, this one's on fire. Look at that fire of the Holy Ghost. Stop sitting, stop fornicating, stop doing that. Wow, he's really anointed. Honestly, I, um, I, I guess I don't fit in the religion. You know, I could easily be talking about the Lotus Sutra here or something else and how people believe certain things about that. Uh, I could be talking about a history book, you know, a history book on uh, the Medici family of uh, Florence, of, of Italy, and the Renaissance, and, and what was really the cause of the Renaissance. There's lots and lots of issues I could dive into, and I enjoy it so much. But the main thing is, when someone asks me about the wickedness of man continually, I'll say, well, when did that ever stop? That was what was created. I believe bad, God got a bad rap in the Bible, yeah, in a way, yeah. By lousy writing and by writing, you know, having um, inconsistencies and logical inconsistencies. I feel that's terrible for children and I feel it's, you know, I've for a long time been bothered about it, now I'm publicly speaking about it, but for many years I've been bothered by this. Trish, Trish will attest to that, she knows. I said, I better not talk about it publicly because I want anyone to lose their faith. And now it's like, well, if you got faith based on stuff like that, like what I've seen, you better lose it. I, maybe it's a good thing. I, I can't worry about it. I, I have the blessing of the Lord to speak, and I am. And we'll see. Maybe he'll stop it from going up. I mean, is this as blasphemous as, how about, how about the movie Stigmata, where the question was asked, if the kingdom is within you, what do you need the Catholic Church for? And the, right? How about that one? 
And then the answer is you do need the Lord, despite how we've messed up religions, despite how we've used religion to go to war with other people and bludgeon them and, and kill them all in the crusades. How dare we not repent? How dare we and how dare they? Whoever A and B is, whoever the one tribe versus the other and using religion and God to justify it. I mean, this goes on. So Moses is a psychopathic killer and, and, and basically, you know, insane. And um, you go on to the next, you know, from, from the Luciferian perspective, we're in the court of law saying, now, um, yes, there is sacrificial whatever in Lucifer, but, you know, it's mainly, it's not like this. And it's like, well, it's, there's no difference because they're humans. There are humans on Lucifer's side, there's human, well, isn't everyone half and half? Aren't people really just Lucifer on one hand and, and, uh, and, and Jesus on the other? Aren't people within themselves split to be one and the other in the same vessel? Isn't that the meaning of Genesis? Isn't that the cosmogony of Lucifer becoming intertwined? Isn't that the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help me God? And that the, the whole notion of man, if man is to survive, he must unentwine himself from this to be free, but can't do it on his own, needs a savior, needs a supernatural event to set him free. And isn't it true that Luciferianism does not in fact set people free, but enslaves them? And are those demons real? Yes, they are. Are those entities real? Yes, they are. Are the UFOs real? Yes, they are. Are those other races of beings real? They sure are. And they all know that the, that reality does exist. And they all know that the Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim, Jesus Christ, the one, the most high God, he exists and they know that children are children of the most high and there's children of, of Lucifer. And he knows that this whole thing is, it, people know that all of that exists and has been mishandled by man, the information that is. Finally, do I need, I'm sorry, Eli, I don't know how you wound up out there, but I'm in, or in there, I'm, I'm here. Finally, do I need the structure of this church to exist in my relationship with the Almighty God? The answer is no. Does anyone, the answer is no, but humans prefer social groups and structures, which is what, you know, the churches and religions in general are all about. The danger is they become used for um, personality splitting for one thing. That is to get you as a child to accept things that are not true or that should be questioned and then have you not question them, eventually creating a split that they can take advantage of, okay? It's, that's like one, mind control technique 101. Once you accept the abuse, that the abuse, it's just we don't talk about it. It does go on, but then it doesn't get mentioned at the family dinner table. Once you get to that point, you're insane. But more than that, you're compliant. Yes, when you cover it up, you're being compliant. You are easy to control because if you want to get a cookie, you can't bring that up at the table. As far as the geo, this is how I got kicked out of family dinners. I've, I've been kicked out of more things you can imagine just for what I just did right there. And I'm doing it as a podcast. People are free to come and go if you like. I, I have to be me. I have to save my peace. I've got to say my piece. Some things just can't be done in a four minute song, you know, even with great poetry in it. It, it still, I mean, th this, this could be handled in, in any less than the time it took. I have to be able to state my piece because there's so many people who are seeking, they want so badly. They know there's something missing in them and they, the only the Lord can fill it up. So you go to these Nazi organizations called churches and they, in, in, in order to fill up, uh, you, you've got to buy all their BS. 
and, and it makes you insane. Um, and it may make you susceptible to being recruited into Luciferianism, uh, embracing it fully, thanking God that you're not um, a God guy. I, and, and, and truly, everyone needs the Lord. And the twice dead, you know, those people that sort of belong there and they're never going to change. And God sometimes shows me them. I, I don't worry about them. But why should you? I don't worry about anything. He, he's in control. Here's my faith at the end of the day. God's in control, number one. I owe everything to the Lord. Everything is, every, any question I have, I have to ask him everything about everyone because I don't trust, you know, people to, you know, even people that are, I don't trust myself either. We, our, our best is not good enough, folks. You know, I, I try to be really earnest. I've, I've, I find many mistakes in my, um, in my uh, interacting with people and, things I shouldn't have said and things I've done that were not, you know, not right. And then I'm, you know, a good word to say is I'm sorry. And another word is I repent and I'm going to try better next time. But if it happens again, I'm going to have to repent again and just realize that I'm flawed and, and the Lord's going to deal with that. And I'm going to keep on uh, admitting that. And I admit, I don't have the answers on these scriptures. I just know that if I don't, in order for me to have mental health and to have freedom, I must be free to question that which I didn't question some years back. I tried to buy everything. They, t they tried to, you know, tell me all this stuff. And for a, quite a few years, I went in the Bible and I was explaining this and explaining that. But again, it was more going with scriptures that inspired me in that moment rather than trying to give a cohesive um, look at this this whole thing including humanity and then not wanting people to lose their faith because they were you know if their faith is based on the infallibility of the Bible then I feel sorry for them because obviously then at some point they're going to crack up and they're going to lose their faith but not because of me they're going to lose it because they're good or their eyes will never be open and they'll just be you know the same thing as the uh, zombies I mean it's it's up to you what you want to be. I, I say that no man is free unless one has freedom of thought. That's true freedom. I could even be incarcerated in a little cell and you, you have economic incarceration right now. You can't go where you want. You can't do what you want. So you're incarcerated basically economically, which is the same as having a prison. It's an economic... Oh, they're very aware of that. Don't worry. They know exactly. But it's good if you know you're incarcerated. But if your mind is free. You're free. You got to fight all the, the, the God of the airways off your, out of your head, though. You've nice if you don't have that. That's where the Lord comes in. What good is it if I'm bummed out all day long from all the bad thoughts that are coming into my head from the news and this and that and all the horrible things? Am I free then? No. I have no freedom of thought. I'm forced to deal with what they want me to deal with. Some things to think about, okay? You know, and, and again, feel free to never listen to me again. And feel free to, um, you know, call me a complete lunatic, heretic, whatever, because I'm not going to drink your Kool-Aid. I'm not going to have your, um, you know, Zig Heils. I'm not going to, um, you know, do your goose stepping. I'm not, I'm just, you know, not going there. I'm not going to be handing your... Uh, you, you know your 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 tracks out on the corner um, to 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 get people into salvation. Oh, there was something I was going to read to you, and I think this would be a good capper. This podcast is going to be um, you know epic, like like they all are. But let's see if I can find this important. I told her I'd read this. Okay, uh, we've been discussing prophecy in the end times of how everyone's trying to time the end and time the rapture and. They're saying all these terrible things are going to happen to mankind. And I'm like, they're happening, brother, man. Hey, and they've been happening. You know, worse doesn't even matter anymore. If you wouldn't, once you're bludgeoned, who cares? Oh, that's okay. Um, so I told her I was going to read what she wrote because she wrote a really good thing and, and she goes, wow, well, if it makes sense, go for it. If stones are start getting thrown, you can take the blame, lol. Or as Jesus said, if you become my disciple, these stones will serve you. 
Um, I, I'm not worried about that. I've had, you know, all my life I've had stones thrown at me. That's nothing new. Um, so we're going with it. Okay, we're going to get into her. This th th she put it in a way that you know I think is pretty eloquent. And this is just a sister in Christ, but we're in this inner church. We're not in the outer church. The end. Okay, so the, talking about the end times, and we just looked at this whole thing about the end times. Someone had a dream, and they laying it all out. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to be Ebola. It's going to be this. It's going to be that. It's going to be World War Three, and, and then after World War Three, there's going to be chaos and economic poverty, and people would be murdering and stealing from each other. And then this is going to happen. Then, and then eventually, then Jesus, when he returns, he comes for his bride. And he takes the bride out, and then he's going to judge the world. And he's going to really open. Then he's really going to burn them to death. And then. And then, you know, most of the people are killed on the earth, but still there's a big fireball that could, you know, whatever. So there's that, okay? And I admit that it was a kind of, um, it seemed like a little too late, a little too late to be, but they, they roll that stuff out, these, the, 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 especially the, the rapture um, thing. Anyway, so her take on it is the end, when it keeps saying the end, when the end is near, the end will come when? I'm waiting for you. When? 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 Oh, just a little ways longer. The end is a person. And the event is the marriage. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom within, or the kingdom, period, which happens to be within. Once again, I, I mean, three sentences sums it up. The end is a person and the event is the marriage. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom within. Matthew 24, 14, Luke 17, 20 and 21, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, as far as scriptural uh, evidence. Okay, so... And then, of course, we're quoting here, she quotes from the book Gospel of Thomas, which is not really in the Bible, but it doesn't really matter because it's uh, considered to be legit. So let's, let's go through. Okay. The disciples said to Jesus, uh, tell us, how will our end come? And Jesus said, have you found the, the beginning then that you are looking for the end? You see, the end will be where the beginning is. Quite perfectly said. Congratulations to the one who stands at the beginning. That one will know the end and not taste death. Jesus said, Congratulations to the one who came into being before coming into being. If you become my disciples and pay attention to my sayings, these stones will serve you. For there are five trees in paradise for you. They do not change. Summer or winter and their leaves do not fall. Whoever knows them will not taste death. Okay, then it says, Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, and the apocalypse is the revealing or uncovering of Jesus Christ. Once again, Prophecy is the testimony of Jesus, and the apocalypse is the revealing, well, that's what it means, it means to reveal the, the revelation. The apocalypse is the revealing or uncovering of Jesus Christ. And that's Revelation 1, 1 and 19, 10, Romans 8, uh, 18 through 30. If we continually look for the end times as an external event or events in history, linear time, we will never escape the matrix. Our escape is in a person, not a future event. The gospel of the kingdom is all about the marriage uh, for the son, capital S. In the book of Revelation, the end is found at the beginning, but without the curse or tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's Revelation 22 as a reference. Jesus, the I am, says he comes quickly, the, exter the eternal present. Okay, I, I come quickly. That, that is, he comes in the present moment. The eternal present, he's all, he comes quickly. Okay, here he is. I come quickly, the eternal present, to reward each individual person according to his work. Jesus is the beginning and the end, <clears throat> the Alpha and the Omega. 
Okay, he just said that. If you're standing at the beginning, you're standing at the end. In him, we have the beginning and the end. And if you stand at the beginning and, and have the end, i.e. Alpha and Omega, meaning Jesus, then you will not taste death. Amen. If you exist in the present moment, you cannot taste death. Amen. Our fall began when we separated from Jesus Christ, became a divided kingdom, and ate from another tree. So our ending will be, will, will be when we are married back to Jesus Christ, our kingdom, Matthew 22, 1 through 14. The outer darkness of Matthew 22, 13 and 14 is what John is describing in Revelation 22, 15. It is not being able to consummate the wedding and eat again from the tree of life within, Jesus, which is Jesus Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, so that you we will not taste death, the second death. John wrote the book of Revelation from a perspective of the time always being at hand. I know, total heretic. Um, I can't, I'm not going to say right now who it is. I, 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 I'm, I'm sworn to anonymity. They, they're, they're concerned with this kind of, I mean, this is hot stuff, right? I mean, this is the kind of stuff that in the past you, 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 you burned at the stake. <laughs> Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him and also they which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Clouds in scripture are symbolic of the presence of the Shekinah glory of God. Jesus Christ. And every eye shall see him could also mean perceiving or seeing with the mind of the spirit, not necessarily with physical eyes, period. Now, I read that because that's pretty much my, uh, I mean, you know, it's nice to uh, know you're not, you know, it's, there's a lot of people that feel this way. This is, a, this is a whole different perspective. This is looking at it from within, at the whole thing from within, not from without. So I know Jesus is real. I also know that, you know, these issues in the Bible of inconsistencies with, you know, what God did here that he didn't do there and different things. And then them telling, the, the inconsistency is not that those are questions to be asked and issues to grapple with, for, especially for young people. The issue is, is when it's taught to not question. You're taught to not think. You're taught to not live. The, the person that I am because I think and ponder things is the person God made me to be so that I could be available to be brought back, you know, to the Lamb. If I were different, I'd be closed off to it because I would already know all the answers. And with that, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, and everybody else, and all you other beings and all the different realms and universes and, and megaverses and whatnot, uh, I think this is probably going to be pretty good. But I have to finish by saying, in the name of Jesus, I pray that our eyes are opened and we see he comes quickly. Amen. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. It just puts a whole different perspective on, on everything, doesn't it? When we look from within rather than without, when we look from the internal to the eternal, when we realize that all is, it's here now, not just around the corner, just a little while longer, We must somehow find a way to be at peace. And I can't be at peace if I'm constantly following. Now, when, yes, yes, years ago, I'd follow all the external events like everybody else. And then eventually, I, I just, it started, my understanding started deepening and changing through time. Even, you know, the, the seeds of it were there in 2004, 2005 about forgiveness about soul tracks, about translation, about all kinds of things that we just don't get to deal with too often. And yes, this trumps the news. Sorry, but okay, the news out there, um, it's bad. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're the, 
the, the bad guys do, you know, the canines are at it again. They're slaying Abel all over the world. And, um, you know, they're, they're killing the truth and they're killing integrity and they're killing what, what, every, anything that's godly they want to mess up. They're overwhelming the system. They're stealing your money. They're taking everything that uh, isn't tied down. And um, then they're sitting there on top of it wanting you to worship them and kiss their feet for doing so. Um, which, of course, you, you, you know, the public does with great, with great um, respect and, and uh, you know, may I say the word al alacrity? Um, uh, I want to give you the definition of that. What a great word. Alacrity. Alacrity. Brisk and cheerful readiness. <laughs> Wasn't that the perfect word? <laughs> with great alacrity, I said. Not great, but I mean with alacrity. In other words, with a great and cheerful readiness, they kiss the, the boots of their enslavers. Yes, alacrity was the perfect word. Now there's a word that needs to be used more often, folks. You use that word, alacrity. That's something like Bill O'Reilly would ask at the end of his show, right? Isn't alacrity a kind of word that would be on the Bill O'Reilly show, Trish? On the Bill O'Reilly show, does he still have words at the end? The word, the word. Does he have the word of the day? Well, wouldn't the word alacrity be a great word for for him? That's the thing I liked about Bill O'Reilly. That's the old teacher side of him. I like that. I like teachers. Like I said, I was in that little GED class. And the teacher asked me, you know, ask the class, you know, what do you hope to get out of this? And we were reading books too in there. You know, it was kind of like a little high school. It was kind of a quasi high school slash you got your GED, but you also got a high school diploma too. It was like an alternative high school. So we were reading books and doing reports and things. And, I, and, I, and it did, she asked, it got to me, it was like, I want to learn how to think. I didn't know what it meant at the time. But then she repeated that when we got our diplomas, you know, when we had a little graduation. And she repeated, um, when she was summing up the class, she repeated when I told her I wanted to learn how to think. And I guess, you know, it's like, I didn't even realize how powerful that statement was because I actually, over time, learned how to think. Maybe not back then. It was really hard for me to concentrate on reading a book or any of that. But in time, I actually became a kind of a, a, a pro prophetic fulfillment for me. I may not be the greatest thinker, but I do spend my time thinking about things and wondering about things. And I guess that wonderment, I, I, I seem to be getting even more so now to where I feel like I'm almost regaining my childhood. Like when I was a child, I used to wonder about the stars in outer space. I just wondered and wondered and wondered about the moon and the stars. And I was just, that was like my favorite, favorite of all time things. You know, I, I, I wonder why I didn't go into astronomy. I guess because I would have had to have lied and said there is no such thing as you know, aliens or Planet X or whatever. You know what I mean? It would have been hard for me to work at NASA. <laughs> but shoot, man. I mean, I can't think of anything more pleasant than being able to, uh, I, I don't know if Planet X exists. I, I have no idea. That's just like, that's out in the popular. To me, it's like everything is a myth and all the information they say is true is a myth. This whole life is a myth, a vapor. This whole thing is a is not really completely real. It's like a process we're going through and we have to do it cheerfully because the Lord is bringing us through and, and we're learning things. And maybe the soul does learn. I want to also say that I could have made a mistake when I said my soul seems to be um, me and it doesn't change and it doesn't learn anything. Maybe it does learn stuff and maybe that's why we're here for our soul to learn something. But I, I do believe it's not intertwined with the flesh and the fall of man that once it liberated, it, it, a lot of the things that occur to us and desires that we would have, the soul doesn't really have. But maybe the soul desires to be here in some way. Maybe there's something it gets out of it. Maybe it's not called learning, but I'm, 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 that, you know, I'm just giving you my thoughts on the matter. And this is not coming from on high. I, I don't know the, the real answer. I'm just, it seems to be that me is me. It's my soul. I know it, I know it's here with me. 
I'm the same as I was when I was three. It's the same soul, same soul, same thing. It doesn't seem to have changed. So that's my observation right now. I don't have a hypothesis about it. I don't, a lot of things I do, I say, have our opinion and hypothesis and things like that. Um, in questioning the Bible, I'm not from on high saying, this should be ripped down and thrown out. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that if I don't question something that needs to be questioned, then I could become split and more susceptible to being scalped. Oh, so what's scalped? If they take the soul out of you and put something else in you that makes you obey them, kind of like invasion of the body. You know, people know about all this. And they do sci-fi movies to show you they know. But it's a terrible thing, you know, being a farm animal, you know, being harvested for souls, not being told that's what's going on. If that's true, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of maybe 75% convinced that's what it is, or at least I've seen enough to get me to the 75 percentage mark, that that's basically what it is. And that's a horrible thing, that, that it's really like being a farm animal. And so, and then when we vote and have things like we think we have choices, we're overridden and some awful war starts, even though we all protest and say no, or they have a banking crisis and they steal all the money. And, and, and no matter what we say, um, the people at the border, they just open them up and Homeland Security trains to start shooting the, um, the people who are paying their paychecks. I mean, you can't make this up. This is total horror. Is it any wonder that I would rather look at the root cause of this horror, which I believe we've proven today, have we not? Have we looked at the root cause of the horror today? I absolutely think we have. I think we've gotten down to the nub of what causes um, all the violence and all the wars and all the pain and all the suffering. That's what I'm interested in. Why, why look at the symptoms, i.e. all the pain, all the suffering, all the bad things people do. Why do they do those things? How can we stop them? Are we just helpless and we have to wait till Jesus returns? That's another um, myth. Where did he go? Animal. I'm, I, I think we're just going to leave it with a question.